find in your Bibles the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Now, here's where we're at in, in thy kingdom. I, I've used this phrase a lot. I want us to learn how to walk in victory. You, you maybe have heard this term before, like let's walk out our Christian faith. If, if you're going to talk the talk, you need to... Oh, you guys have heard it. Like I'm, I'm talking to a well-educated crowd this morning. You get it. But have you ever like thought or given some thought to like what does the walk actually look like? For many of us, we're really good at studying the Bible... And we, we need to do that. As a matter of fact, here's where we are. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, we, we actually go from doctrinal to practical. This is brilliant. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit can the Bible be written this way. In the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul details doctrine. Like, we need to understand that. We need to know what, what we believe so we'll know how to walk the walk. And now in Ephesians 4, we get very, very practical. Many preachers have said it this way. It's, it's faith, faith with our feet. Uh, D.O. Moody, the famous evangelist, is famous for saying it's religion and shoe leather. I love that, right? How do I put to practice what it is that I'm learning? Now, we're literally going from a, a heavenly position of sort of understanding and knowing where we're seated to an earthly position of obedience and walking. And so what we want to learn today is this, that, that revelation, like what I learned is now going to turn into realization. That doctrine should turn into doing. Like what I know, I should walk out. Precept into practice. Precept is law. It's line after line. Now watch. Sitting is going to turn into walking. Have you ever felt this way or heard somebody say this way that that was new to the Christian faith? Like, I'm not sure that I can live the Christian life. Well, that's entirely true. Of course, you and I know that not to split... Uh, frog's hair, if you will, but here, here's what we know. The, the, the Christian life is absolutely impossible unless it's lived through the power of Christ. But here's my point. Watch this about Ephesians 4. So in, in chapter 1 of Ephesians, we actually start out seated, doctrinally seated. But practically, I love that because the Christian life doesn't start out, although it may feel like it, The Christian life doesn't start out with running. The Christian life doesn't start out with leaping. The Christian life doesn't start out with even walking. The Christian life actually starts with rest. He wants you to be seated. Like, take a moment, learn who I am, and the more you learn, the more you know how to walk out your faith. I love that. Thank God the Bible is going to tell you and I that, 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 that God tells you and I to walk the Christian life. How many would raise their hand this morning and say, thank God he didn't tell me to run it like I'd give up after a mile, right? Thank God he didn't tell me to leap it. Thank God he didn't tell me to leapfrog it or to carry something along. He said, I'll take the burden. He said, I'll do all the running. I'll do all of it. All I want you to do is literally walk. So we begin with the resting position, which is so beautiful, and now we're told to walk it out. So I'm going to begin reading um, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to point out a few words, uh, maybe like I do all along the way. Now, here's here's an important word, and it's the second word into the verse. I, therefore. Now, here's why I said that Ephesians 4 now gives us everything he just taught us in chapters 1 through 3 because of that word, therefore. He literally is wrapping up everything like, okay, here's what he's saying. Now that I've said all of that, now that there's an understanding of who you are, where you're seated in the heavenlies, and yes, you're walking on the earth with your feet on the, in the, on the earthlies, I, I'm telling you, he said, therefore, everything I just taught you, do this. A prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy, watch, of the calling to which you have been called. Stop. It's not just full-time ministers that are called to ministry. The Bible says as a follower of Christ, each and every one of us are called to walk in a manner worthy of everything we've just been discovered in, been found in, our position where we're seated in, in Christ. Thank God it is a walk. It is not a run. Thank God that it begins with rest, that we're seated. Thank God that he sort of eases us into this. Um, Today, uh, my grandson is 11 months old, and he is just now starting to flirt with walking. And and all of that time that he was seated, if you will, with his mom and his dad, he was learning all that got him to this point. That's the way you and I are. Aren't you glad the Christian life doesn't expect you and I to be spiritually mature from day one? 
that we're able to be seated and rest and learn and grow. But you've been called to this. Now watch with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one father of all who is over all and through all and in all, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. All right, let's unwrap this. Let's, let's literally take doctrine and turn it into practical living when someone says the Christian life is a walk. In this series, when I'm saying you need to learn to walk in victory, walk out your faith as you just retorted, if you're going to talk the talk, walk the walk, what does that mean? Like, Physically, in this world, what does it look like to walk like a Christian? So let's start out, with, first of all, with purposeful walking. He lays it out for us. I kind of want to just uh, package it, if you will, in three things of the walk. Number one, if you think about a walk, and he lines it for us, a walk starts with a decision. The very first thing you need to know is Christ. And the moment that I know Christ and I learn about him, now I'm discovering that, uh, okay, let me go back. Let me, let me go back. All right, when I first started pastoring, and some churches still do this, when I first started to pastor, we would give an altar call. And at the end of the altar call, someone would come and you know, meet with me or, or one of our uh, uh, counselors up front. And here's what we would say next. Literally, right after that decision was made and we heard the music kind of winding down and we were ready to move on to the next thing, we would say this, have a seat on the front row, right? Like you've made that decision, have a seat, we're going to follow up with you afterwards. If we're not careful, that's, that's sort of how we'll approach the Christian faith. We'll remain seated. The Bible tells you and I, it goes from sitting, a seated position, to a walking position. So there needs to be a point in your life where, where you're just like, you know, I, I, the Christian life is difficult. No, no it's impossible. I, there's some things about doctrine that I still don't understand. Like you're going to say those things like, I'm not even sure where the book of Ephesians is. All of this is so new to me. Again, every time I study this, I, I have to remind myself, this is the first time these Christians are hearing this message. Like the very first time. And I know as a new believer, you're hearing that. But you, you and I have the benefit, the benefit of bookstores. We have the benefit of, of, of Google. We have the benefit to search. Like, what does this mean? How do I break that down? Like, well, what is the source of this? They didn't have that. They literally had the prophets, the apostles speaking the truth of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit confirming in their heart that this is what it means to live out the Christian life. And Paul is telling them right now, everything you just learned needs to turn into a walk. Everything you need to that you just learned needs to turn into a walk. Meaning, we are so glad you're in church, but this is where you, you come to be refreshed. This is like halftime in the game time. This is where you get ready, you start. This is the first day of the week, not the last day of the weekend, where on this day you get to go out and now walk your faith out in your job. Walk your faith out in your family. Walk your faith out in your own heart. What does that look like? It starts with a decision. Listen to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. The Bible says it this way, he who says he abides in me, like I go to church, I'm a follower of Christ, my life has been changed, should do what? Should walk in the same way in which he walked. Now notice the difference, the, the last he is capitalized. You and I are to imitate, you and I are to model our own walk after the one who walked on this earth, Christ. The Bible makes that very clear. A walk starts with a decision. Let me ask you this. Can you name the parts of your Christian faith where you've determined to walk like Christ? Like, can you say, like, in my prayer life, we just went over that. In my speech life, in my mental life, in my ministry life. Remember, you're, you're, you're called to this. This is a calling to walk worthy of Him. Maybe this puts another dynamic on it when I say it this way. What you do pays your bills, but who you are is a minister in Jesus Christ. God has given you that job Yes, for, for benefit to your family to provide and to survive, but it's not just a job. And that job, when you get to heaven, God is not going to say, were you a good employee? Come on, into, come on into heaven. 
He, obviously, he wants you to be a faithful employee, but being an employee is not, does, does not change your life in your heart and does not gain you entrance into heaven. God has given you that job. God, dads, God has given you that family to literally walk out your calling no matter where you are. Have you made a list of the areas of your life where you're still weak in the walk? I'm maybe weak in trusting. Maybe I'm weak in giving. Maybe I'm weak in serving. Maybe I'm weak in going, like on a missions trip. And, and again, missions trip doesn't necessarily mean across the seas. It could be across the street. It could be in another state. But have you listed the areas where you're weak in your walk? When God does what God does and it begins to make your life more like Him, Right? Do you know those areas where you're like, okay, God, I'm going to make this walk a decision in my life. I'm deciding to study the Bible more. I'm deciding, I'm committing to become a man or a woman of prayer. I'm deciding to be better in the area of trust. I'm deciding to be better in the area of giving. I'm deciding to be better in the area of going and in serving. Like all the areas that the Word of God says, this is how we walk. Do you know those areas where you're weak? Have you made the decision to be stronger? Now, most of the time in our life, by a natural rhythm of the calendar, we wait until January 1. You know where I'm going, right? To make a resolution that says, I'll eat less donuts. Well, have you, you need to do that on a daily basis, but not just donuts, but on a daily basis, look back at, at the day that just passed and said, I was a little airy in that, in that area of trust. It was a little hard for me to hear your voice. My, my thoughts were a little bit sort of splintered in these areas. I was pursuing this more than I was pursuing you. This was an opportunity that you placed in front of me, but I missed it because my heart wasn't in tune with you. So right now, Father, I'm making a decision. Have you made the decision to walk in the same way Christ has walked? The Bible says it's a calling in your life and in my life. And by the way, I, I say this so often, Often the, the greatest testimony might not be carrying a Bible into your office. The, the greatest testimony might not be having a cross around your neck that's a good-looking piece of jewelry. It might just be that in consistency of your walk around those that are lost, they can see that your feet are on a different path because your eyes are aimed at something else. Amen. Have you made that decision? Lord, put my feet on a different path. When the rest of the world is walking this way in culture, when the, when the rest of the world is thinking this way, I'm going to walk countercultural. But it's not so much countercultural. I'm going to walk toward Christ in this area. And it may be a physical walk. It may be a physical decision. It may be an emotional walk. It may be an emotional decision. But the moment you make a decision to follow Christ, every day is a decision. And, and just a, a little while, at the end of the 11 o'clock service, we're going to baptize about 12 people and every time I do baptism, you know this, if you ever heard me say it, I'm like, the Christian life is nothing but steps of obedience. That's all the Christian life is. It's a decision on a daily basis, moment by moment, to follow Christ. Also, it's number two, a walk that needs a destination. Right? You, you got to know where you're headed. I mean, this is simple. We don't have to spend a whole lot of time here because I'm actually going to expand it. Paul is, rather, in just a moment. I'm just going to take his notes and just add something to them. That's really all we're going to do this morning. It's called a sermon. But really, a walk is a destination. So here's the question. Are you growing in Christ? The Bible just told you in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, that you need to walk in the same way, capital H, he walked. So are you growing, and are you growing in Christ-likeness? So it needs a destination. So once you've identified, like, God, I need to grow in the area. He's going to list a whole lot of them in just a moment. I need to grow in the area of trust. I need to grow in the area of giving. I need, I need to grow in the area of faith and in wisdom and in discernment and in strength and in courage and in sharing and evangelism and, and, be, and serving in, in mission, missionary work. I need to trust you. I need to walk by faith in my job, walk by faith in my family. Walk by faith in my emotions in my own head. Are you growing into Christ-likeness? It needs a destination. So what does that practically mean? That means every day you get up and you're like, God, help me to be more like you. That's all you really have to pray. And then let God do his work. And then say, give me discernment and wisdom to identify where you're working on me right now and wisdom to know how to apply it. Here's the third thing about a walk. A walk needs determination. I saw something this week I've never seen before, and that's what I love about the Bible. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31. Many of you could probably quote this, right? Like if you've ever visited your grandmother's house, it's probably on a poster somewhere in her house, right? But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. 
They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Okay, I've never seen this before. In my natural mind, I always thought that was a descending order. I, now, if you'll let me just literally watch. To me, it, to me, it descended. In other words, I went from having wings that were flying, and I went from running, and I went to walking. I saw that as descending. There's a reason why the Bible put that in the order in which it did. Because the scriptures never call you and I to fly like an eagle. The scriptures never call you and I to run like a sprinter. The scriptures call you and I to walk out our faith. I always saw that as descending. I'm like, I want to stay up there with the eagles. I want to fly. And there are times when I absolutely want to run either to things or from things or I want to run to you. But he doesn't end with a descend. He ends with ascension. He actually says, I don't want you always living in the heavenlies. I don't want you running to and running from. You're going to exhaust yourself. The greatest thing you can learn to do is walk. Do you see that? Walk and what? Not. Now, we always put it in terms of like, I'd like to be able to go up five flights of steps and not faint. I'd like to be able to, you know, walk a, a, a marathon or something. We put it in, in stuff like that. The Bible tells you and I the greatest thing he is calling you and I to do is be determined. It's a walk. Thank God, right? If it was a race, I would give up. If it was a race, determination would be tested in me. If it was leaping, if it was anything other than walking. But thank God, that's something that each and every one of us can do because each and every one of us are called to do it. We're not called to fly. We're not called to run. We're called to walk. And that's something common and needs to be consistent among all of us. It takes determination to get up every day. Sometimes it takes determination to put one foot in front of the other, doesn't it? Sometimes it takes determination to walk right into that job, right into that home, right into that situation that needs forgiveness. Sometimes it takes determination to walk right into the Word of God and say, Okay, Holy Spirit, deal with this in my life. I want this addiction gone. I want this stronghold gone. I want help with my emotions. I want help with my anxiety. I want help with all, right, all of those things. Sometimes it just takes a consistent, determined walk to say, okay, one foot in front of the other, and the next thing, another foot, and then another foot, and then another foot. Thank God he didn't call us to run. We'd all give up. Thank God he didn't call us to leap. We'd all give up. But he called every one of us to walk out our faith. So let's talk about power walking. Watch the words that he actually uses to describe a powerful walk in Christ. Now, notice, I, I, I said it this way, not necessarily a play on words. I mean, it kind of is a play on words, but it's not necessarily. There are so many things about walking. I think there are times I can walk more in faith than I can in gentleness. I think there are times I can walk more in faith and courage than I can patience. So the things that he rattles off are the things that keep you and I positionally walking out our faith. Watch what he says here. Number one, he says, walk with humility. I love the way somebody worded it here. They said this humility is it's the grace of God that humbles a man without degrading him and yet exalts him without inflating him. I love the, that is such a beautiful description of humility. Because often, have you ever been around somebody and, and you say something and they do this, oh, I'm going to step back because the lightning bolt's about to fall, right? <laughs> or you do something or say something or whatever and, and somebody's like, oh, God's just going to come in and just whack you over the head, right? They say stuff like that. Often that's how, what we think about humility. We think God is going to strike us down and point to us and give us what I call the sermonator, like I'm going to put you in your place. And that's, we think humility is seeing God like this. I love this description. It's the grace of God that comes in and reminds us, I can't do this walk without him. And yes, I stumbled. Yes, I tripped. Yes, I may have wanted to faint. Yes, I may have run out of energy. But it's the grace of God. Paul says, when I am strength, that is when his grace is strongest in my life. Thank God in that moment in my walk when I'm weak, God doesn't come in and humiliate me. The grace of God comes in and humbles me without degrading me. God said, it's okay that you slip. That's what I'm there for. It's okay that you don't have strength to walk into the situation. That's why I'm here. It's not your strength. That's my strength. That's not your power. It's my power. It's not your grace. It's my grace. 
But it's the humility of God that comes in and doesn't humiliate us or degrade us. But at the same time, it doesn't puff us up where we're like, well, look what I just did. It exalts us without inflating us. The beauty of grace and the beauty of the humility of God in the midst of the walk. I do get asked this quite frequently for those that serve, and they, they start to receive comments. I'll never forget, like when I was in seminary, and, and I apologize if there are elderly ladies in the audience. And so, but anyway, I had uh, one uh, preacher, a professor of preaching, he said to me, Don't listen to everything the grandmothers in the church tell you. I thought, what does he mean by that? He went on to explain, he goes, oh, to, the, to every grandmother, they love everybody. So they're going to come, you're the best preacher I've ever heard. And after a while, you're going to be like, oh, I am the best preacher anybody's ever heard. He was like, don't listen to that, like, right? You're going to get yourself puffed up. I get asked this a lot by those that serve. They're like, you know, people are starting to tell me I'm doing a good job. And how do I strike the balance of not thinking that it's me doing a good job and that it's God doing that job through me? Because they're like, Pastor Ron, I hear people come to you all the time, and that's the greatest message I've ever heard, this and that, and this and that, and this and that. It's not about me at all. That's what the grace of God does. The grace of God comes in and reminds you it's not you at all, but he does it without humiliating you. And he also does it by lifting you up, but not exalting you to the point where you think you can now walk without God. So you and I, first of all, we have to have the strength and the courage to walk in humility. How much strength does it take to humble yourself and surrender to God and say, I cannot do this without you, but with you, I will walk, I will walk right into that. Here's the second thing he calls us to, gentleness. Now, let me define this. Actually, I gave it to you in notes. Gentleness is not poor posture. It is firm faith. Gentleness walks into a room with authority not with this submission. What I mean by poor posture is we often think of gentleness as someone that's like, they're walking along like this, like, it's okay, it's okay. And there might be times for that actual posture, but gentleness actually walks in the strength and the power of God with all humility, with all authority, the kingdom authority of God. And when you walk into the room because of the gentle spirit, yet it's the spirit of God that is coming out of you more than the spirit of you propping yourself up, people feel a difference. People know when gentleness walks in a room. You know when awkwardness walks in a room. You know when a big ego walks into the room. You know when ignorance walks into a room. Right? You know that. You, through the power of Christ, the room knows when a person of gentleness walks in. Like they're like, there's something different about them. I feel like I can approach them, yet I feel like that, that they have something that I don't have. And you can't do that on your own. That is only given by the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. What is gentleness? It is the ability to be controlled and to be taught. I love that. The Bible says as followers of Christ... We need to be more gentle. I can't think of a more culturally appropriate time to use that word now for Christians than ever, right? I, I, in this season of life, I think I've, I don't, I, in all my years of ministry, I've never seen more angry Christians, <laughs> right? Like people are like, you need Jesus. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want that Jesus, you know, like you don't have to yell at me to give me him and so forth. One of the greatest testimonies you could ever display as a follower of Christ, is to walk into a room that is absolutely ignorant, absolutely in darkness, absolutely out of touch with Christ, and yet walk in there with all kingdom authority, surrounded with the humility and the grace of God, but with all gentleness, you can speak truth, and somehow, somehow people don't respond to it negatively. They just respond to it the way they should, and you and I cannot do that without Christ. Our world needs to see followers of Christ who are walking with gentleness. How about this one? The Bible tells you and I that we can walk in patience. I mean, here's another one I think we need. Patience is to live with common sense and not controversy. I love that definition. It's to live with common sense and, and not controversy. When will we ever learn this lesson? Nobody has ever been argued into heaven. Nobody's ever been browbeat into heaven. No one. You and I only come to faith in Christ, one, by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit coming to me and convincing me. There are some arguments that many Christians are having right now that we should not be having arguments about. Often, people come and say, Pastor Ron, when are you going to address this situation from the pulpit? And I'm like, when the Bible tells me to. 
When are you going to speak on this? Because I see a lot of guys are speaking on this or not speaking on this. When are you going to approach that? I'm like, well, the Bible doesn't tell me to approach it. And it certainly doesn't tell me to approach it that way. So here's how we are biblically going to approach that. The Bible tells you not to point everybody to Christ and let Christ be the convictor. I'm not the convictor. Christ is. As long as I lift Christ up, the Bible says all, all men will be drawn unto him. It is my job to lift up Christ, not lift up my opinion. And I'm to live in peace with others, which leads us to the next one. The Bible says with comma love, with love. Now watch, this isn't love that you work up. Come on, let's just admit this. It's easy to love the lovely. It's hard to love the unlovely. So you can't work up this love for actions, for things, for ideas, for, for darkness. You and I can't work up this love. This love is given to us. It's the love of God that came down in the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says he wraps all of that up with what's called the bond of peace. Okay, I want to I give you a side sermon to study this week. If you want a good study on how to do all of this, rather a, a good way to see the, the war that's actually taking place within you that doesn't allow you to walk often one step at a time, a, the, one of the greatest studies in the Bible on a, an example of the war that is taking place in your heart. Like, why is it hard sometimes? Like, you just heard this message and everything about you says, I'm supposed to be gentle, I'm supposed to be patient, I'm supposed to be full of humility. But at that moment, there's this lack of peace. So he says, all of this is done in the bond of peace. There's a reason why this is described. There's a reason why this is happening. In Romans 3, starting around verse 10, all the way through chapter 4, or, or rather James, uh, James chapter 3, all the way through James chapter 4, he describes this, this war that is happening within us. Here's a way to summarize it as you study it. The reason why most of us don't have peace or love on the outside is because of the, the lack of peace and love on the inside. The reason why we want to go to war with people is because we're at war in ourselves. Here's another way to say it. Hurting people often hurt people. Angry people on the inside are often angry people on the outside. A person that's often critical on the outside is often super critical on the inside. A person that is often overly negative on the outside is often overly negative on the inside. James describes there's a reason why there's a war on the outside because there's a war on the inside. Just a whole other sermon, by the way, a sort of a sidebar sermon on how to begin living out these things. Here's what we know. We are positioned heavenly with feet on an earthly path. And this is how we live this out. Now, when you first read this, let me go back to it. When you first read all these characteristics, he seems to take an odd turn. And I'll admit, even when I put this sermon together, I was like, really? Like, this seems to be an odd turn. Now, let me just read it one more time. Begin at verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Watch verse 4. There is one body. You're like, wait, wait, wait. There, there had to have been more. Like, I, I keep asking myself, there, there had to have been more. That's like a hard, that's a, that's a hard stop and a hard start to me when I read that. No, it's not. To, to my mind, and maybe to your mind it is, but listen, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of us all, who is over all and through all and in all. Why in the world did he begin to position all of what was just said in this walk in that spectrum? Paul reveals right here seven spiritual realities. Now watch that unite and strengthen the body of believers. Before I ever get into this, let me say this. Thank God the Christian life is not a Lone Ranger Christian life. It is not up to you to live it alone all by yourself. Number one, we know we have the person of God, the person of the power of the Holy Spirit, but you have the beauty of the body of Christ. You have the beauty of the body of Christ. That's why life groups are so important. That's why Bible studies are so important. That's why gathering together is so important. If we were left out there all by ourselves in a world where we could not find anyone else that believed like we believe, how hard would that be to walk the walk? But one of the many reasons why you need to come to church is to be reminded that there is a church, there is a united body of believers around the world that meets locally. I mean, what was it, just two weeks ago? We had Nepal up here. 
It's, it's phenomenal to me that on a weekly basis, I'm talking to pastors in Hebrew. I'm talking to them in, in Spanish. I'm talking to them in Nepalese through Google Translate, by the way. But I, I, the beautiful thing about that is like they're sending me stuff and they're singing and they're worshiping in their language. And, and before I even Google Translate, like what are they singing? I can sense the person and the power of the Holy Spirit through that. Like right now on this day, no matter the time zone, there are Christians around the world gathering to lift up the name of Christ. Think about that. Think of the power that that has right now. You're not in this alone is what I'm trying to say. And the reason why you need the church is because when you come to church, you find out as a dad, there are other dads that are just like you. As a mom, there are other moms that are just like you. As a married couple, there are plenty of other marriages that are just like yours. You will find out there are families that are just like yours. You will find somebody that is either going through what you've been through and you're able to minister to them, or maybe you find somebody that's going through what you're going through, and now you get to come together and pray for each other. That is the beauty of the church. And oh, how they understood that because that's all they had. Sometimes I think that's what we need to be reminded of. The church is really all we have. This is what Christ gave to this earth, a place for you and I to be reminded we are a body of believers. Because you know when the rapture happens, the church and the Holy Spirit are out of here. And that's why it's absolute, utter chaos. Not even a good word for that. But that's why it's absolute chaos, because you and I have this. Why neglect the meeting and the assembling of ourselves together, the book of Hebrews chapter 10, why in the world would you neglect that when this is the one thing you need to help survive in this world and God gave it to you? The power of the local church, and not just the local church, but here, let me rattle this off. Here's the seven realities. He says, we are one body. As measured, if you will, you see it right there, as realized and measured locally and together globally. Like right now, the power of a praying global church, that's what's keeping this thing afloat. That's what's keeping our world together. You, you know that the Bible tells us that. If my people who are called by, by my name will humble themselves and pray, right? You and I need to pray. The church worldwide. He goes, one spirit. One spirit. That's what I love about meeting other pastors and other Christians in other languages. I may not know their language, but something about the Holy Spirit in him and in me tells me, you're a believer, you're a follower in Christ there's something so special about that. And if you've never served on the mission field where you go somewhere where you are totally dependent upon God, God, I don't know what is about to happen. I don't think I know all of their language. And then all of a sudden, as soon as you're there, how your spirit resonates with their spirit through the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, it's incredible. And then you come back and you long for that in the local church. You long to be a part of that. But maybe you've experienced it. You were in line at a coffee shop. You were somewhere eating lunch or somewhere eating dinner or something. You, you just looked at somebody and you just knew they're a believer. They're a believer. And there was comfort in that. There is one spirit. There's one hope of your calling. You see, the beauty of all of this, you and I are on the same walk because we're waiting for the same thing. We're waiting on the return of Christ. And you can look at somebody. You can say, this walk is hard, isn't it? Yes, it is. But one day that trumpet's going to sound. Praise the Lord, right? And that's exactly the, the call, one hope of your calling. One Lord. I love this. It's not a pantheon of gods, and it's certainly not this coexist God thing. Like I actually pray for and somewhat feel sorry for those that have the coexist bumper sticker. I'm like, you literally have no existence because you don't have the one God that's given you the reason for your existence. The irony and the great lie of that bumper sticker that's on the back of your car trying to tell you, no, they can't coexist. There's only one God. But when you and I know that there's one Lord, there's one faith. The book of Jude. The book of Jude. There's one faith, one baptism. Now here he's, he's speaking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like when, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes into your heart and your life. He's not talking about what we're about to do. Can I show off these new shirts? I, I'm so excited about these new shirts. I'm not doing like Superman or anything like that. But I'm not trying to sell a watch or a bracelet or anything like that. But right? It, well, said, it, it's a brand new day. I love that. The moment you come to Christ, it's a brand new day. And we love that. That's one of Raina's songs. Raina gets up every day and goes, it's a brand new day. It's a, we put it on a shirt, right? Because literally, right? It's, you want to sing it right now, Raina? She's like, no, I don't want to sing it. <laughs> but it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The moment you profess faith in Christ, the Bible says at that moment, 
You get the person and the power and the promise of the Holy Spirit. Remind, to remind you, this is not something you work up. It's something that came down to you. Even in receiving the Holy Spirit, God, God never said, you have to work yourself up to receive my blessing. He said, I'm already coming down to you. I am sending to you someone who will come alongside of you and be me, but in this form and in this way. He said, there's one baptism. And he said, there's one God and there's one Father. I love this. Would you just begin to say with me the first line of the Lord's Prayer? Would you just begin to say that with me? Our Father. Stop. What was the first word you just said? The beauty of Jesus Christ is, yes, he is individually yours, but he is collectively all of ours. Our Father. There's something about coming together and worshiping with a body of believers that says we believe in a God that chose us individually, but he chose us and loves us collectively and globally. And you can only call on him as your father when you profess faith, ask for forgiveness of your sins, and at that moment, the person and the power of the Holy Spirit steps into your life, and thank God he doesn't say go out and run it, go out and leapfrog it, go out and sprint it. No, he says go out and walk it. He does give you the wings. He does give you the energy to run. But more than that, he wants to give you all of these qualities, these seven realities, these experiences through these words to walk out your faith. Let me tell you what to do. The best thing you can do is to leave Sunday morning and walk right into Monday morning for Christ and Tuesday and Wednesday the best thing you can do right now is to walk right into your emotions and say, God, I give you my emotions. I give you my expectations. I give you my hopes, my dreams. I give you my hurts, my hang-ups. I give you my past relationships, my current. My, I give it all. And Father, in your power, I'm going to walk with my feet on this earth in the blessing and the power and the person of the Holy Spirit that you've promised me. I'm going to walk out my faith. I'm not just going to show up to church. I'm going to walk like I belong to the body of Christ on this earth until that day you call me home or the trumpet sounds because our world needs to see more people walking towards Christ. That's kingdom authority. It's just walking out your faith. Religion in shoe leather. Amen.